old fashioned. I love the moonlight. I love the old fashioned things. Hi, you're watching episode 18 of the Life of Gem live video podcast. I've titled this episode, Sing and Write Your Life. You'll soon find out why. For those of you who missed it, we started with a song sang by our guest, Peter Churches. He's author of the recent book, Tracks, Memoirs from a Life with Music, recently published by Bamboo Dart Pe Press. And this is going to be a fascinating episode. So put on your seatbelt. Peter Churches is a true Renaissance man, a New Yorker. He's the author of multiple books, including Tracks, Memoirs from a Life with Music, which is available on the Bamboo Dart website. He also wrote a book called Autobiography in Words, which I'm just obsessed with right now, and many more. We're going to talk about his bio in a minute right before he calls in. He's calling in from the East Coast. But first, here's a story I wrote years ago called Sing Your Life, title of a Morrissey song. It's an oldie but a goodie, so I updated it and shortened it for this episode. So here's my story. Sing Your Life. This last weekend was Record Store Day. It brought back how important music has always been to me, how much it defines me, how I would use my last dollar for a record or a concert. My favorite band in high school, of course, was The Smiths. For me, they epitomize post-punk music from the 80s. By high school, I was well-versed in an obsession for them. Their album, Meat is Murder, came out in 1985. By 1986, The Queen is Dead, their magnum opus of an album came out, and I changed from goody two-shoes to punk rock princess, post-punk princess, exchanging my tennis shoes for combat boots and dyeing my hair blue, black, and piercing my nose. Johnny Marr's guitar, along with Morrissey's plaintive yearning crooning of a voice, together was always like butter on toast for me. I played my Smiths albums until they were scratched. The Smiths played at the Hollywood Palladium, and I drove there to Hollywood all wide-eyed. I fought my way to the pit and jumped up and down and screamed to the music. The Smiths broke up my senior my junior year of high school we were devastated the day we found out my best friends and i blasted big mouth strikes again in our place in the quad on a boom box as i bought all my favorite vinyl this weekend from sisters of mercy to a numbered ramones score i was obnoxiously happy what i realized is that i still had it in me this girl that I thought was buried between years and years of worry and drudgery, she was still there. She just needed a little vinyl to come out. That's a part of my story. Now, let's get to my guest. He's going to call in in two minutes, okay? So let me read his bio for you, and you're going to be amazed. Peter Churches is called one of the innovators of the short, short story by Publishers Weekly. Peter has lived his creative life in the literary, music, and performance worlds of New York City and beyond for over four decades as a writer, an editor, a performance artist, a singer, and a lyricist. His most recent book, as I said, is Tracks, Memoirs from a Life with Music, published by Bamboo Dart Press. His writing has appeared in so many magazines, anthologies, websites, including Transatlantic Review, Harper's, Bomb, North American Review, Fiction International, Fence, and Poetry 180. He has published three volumes of short prose fiction with Pelicanesis since 2013. Lift your right arm. 
like I said, autobiography without words and a book called Whistler's Mother's Son. There is so much more to say about Peter. He's going to call in, in in a minute. So to lead him in, let's play some of his music again, April. You got it. One second. And uh, this is a song that uh, Peter adapted. It's a Johnny Mercer tune, and he actually wrote lyrics to it, additional lyrics. Upon a window. Sorry about that. Here you go. The starry sun that April sings. My name's in there. This year's fancies are passing fancies. There he is. Just one second. Let me get him in. There you go. Hi, okay. Peter. Hello. Welcome to the Loop of Gem show. It's so nice to hear your voice. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome in from the East Coast. I know it's late over there, so I hope you drank a lot of coffee. Um, so I want to start out with just saying how much I've read two of your books now, how much your writing moves me. Um, your voice is so compelling, wry, self-deprecating. You lean towards brevity, which I love. And there's a story in one of your books, uh, Autobiography Without Words, where you quote, you quote unquote, things got better when you found your voice as a writer in college. Can you talk to us about your journey to find that writing voice? Sure. Um... I think it was really a matter of the uh, writers I became exposed to in college uh, that keyed into something I was already going in the direction of. Uh, I was studying drama. I was studying playwriting. Uh, the playwright Jack Gelber was one of my teachers at Brooklyn College who wrote The Connection. And I was uh, taking a lot of drama courses, and that's where I discovered Pinter and Beckett, and it was writers like that that showed me that the kind of off-kilter way I was thinking about writing had a tradition that I hadn't previously known about. So I think that's really, it's, it's through reading that my college years kind of solidified the direction I was going to go in as a writer. That's really interesting because similarly for me, James Joyce and Dubliners and Portrait of an Artist and then books like Angela's Ashes, some Irish writers did the same for me. And you have a lot of books, but like we said, the most recent one is this amazing chapbook called Tracks, Memoirs from a Life with Music. I've read it twice now. And the very first story in the book is titled, and they're all titled after bands and songs. Or maybe it's, maybe it's the second story. No, it's the first story. Was The Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand from 1963. And it talks about your early love for the Beatles at about age eight. And I love the way you describe putting a transistor radio under your pillow at night. And you also talk in that story about how one's musical tastes tend to start and they're ingrained and remain. Can you expand on that? Uh. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know if this is true for everybody, but uh, I, I do think that's about the age you start to, eight, eight years, about eight years old, is about the age you start to get a sense of your tastes in all sorts of things in life, uh, and music being one of the most important, but this is part of your whole social life as a kid. You know, everybody's listening back then to the top 40 radio, talking about the songs listening together uh and I, I i as i say in the piece the fact that my eight years old happened at the time of Beatlemania was this <laughs> perfect storm uh because it was just such a you know a big change in the musical landscape and uh for people of my age uh you know born in 1956 uh, that was sort of the beginning of our real intense connection to music. Wow, that's beautiful. I, I as a young kid, was really obsessed with bands from the 70s and 80s, uh, 
like the Go-Go's and Joan Jet and stuff like that. I, I might have been about 10 or 11 when it started, but it was intense. Um, and I just love the way you so artfully in all of your work, but especially in this book, Tracks, the way you weave in music and memoir. And uh, would you mind reading a short piece so uh, before we get into more conversation, the viewers can hear your voice. And just so you know, we have Mark Givens from uh, Bamboo Dart watching. He said, hi, Peter. And then my twin sister, Jackie, who saw Paul. Uh, yeah, my twin sister, Jackie, who's a huge Beatles fan. She saw Paul McCartney recently in uh, the desert. Um, she said, thank you. The Beatles are everything to her and their music deeply changed her. So those are some comments. And so feel free to read. Let us know what you're going to read and take it away. Okay. So I'm going to read the final piece in the book which uh, sort of really does combine the musical and the personal. And it's uh, the title and the music I'm talking about is Billie Holiday, I Cover the Waterfront, 1944. I was very close with my maternal grandparents. They lived in an apartment in the same building as we did, and I'd often go upstairs to visit them or to stay with them when I needed a babysitter. They died within a year of each other in their mid-80s in the late 60s. My grandmother we called Gran, and my grandpa we called Pop. Gran called Pop Pop, and Pop called Gran Mama. Both were Russian Jews, but Gran came to Boston when she was three years old and had a Boston accent without a trace of Russian. She was a thin, slight, perennial, perennially sweet woman who didn't have a bad word for anybody. Pop came to New York when he was a young man to avoid military service and retained a thick Russian accent. He was a short, fat, bald man, about five foot seven and 250 pounds. There was an old photo of him smoking a cigar from the 30s where he was the spitting image of Al Capone. He was a curmudgeon who hardly ever had a good word for anybody except Mama, to whom he was devoted. They both started failing around the same time and ended up in a nursing home. I know that Graham died before March of 1969 and that Pop died after because Pop, who had entered a deep depression, claimed he was holding on only so he could be at my bar mitzvah. Pretty much all Pop ever said after Graham died was, she was a saint with tears in his eyes. Then he died a few months after the bar mitzvah, having nothing left to live for. He weighed 97 pounds. After they had both died, we went upstairs Nobody gives up a rent-controlled apartment in New York to go through their effects and see what there was to keep. I found a cabinet full of 78 RPM records. The only one I can remember was the Billy Holiday disc on the Commodore label that featured I Cover the Waterfront on one side and Lover Come Back to Me on the other. I was already curious about jazz and blues, and I had certainly heard of Billy Holiday, but I'm pretty sure I had never actually heard her. I had heard her song, God Bless the Child, in the version by Blood, Sweat, and Tears, but can't remember if I even knew it was her song, and the total mismatch of song to singer and arrangement still gives me the willies. Back then, many turntables still had the 78 speed and could take a reversible cartridge because the 78 took a thicker stylus than the one for microgroove recording. I didn't have a 78 needle for my turntable, so I played the record with a standard one, which worked, but could ruin the groove. And that's how I heard Billie Holiday for the first time on a crackly 78, played with the wrong kind of needle. It grabbed me. I instantly understood why Billie Holiday was considered such a great singer. It just sounded so natural. I enjoyed both sides of the record, but especially I Cover the Waterfront, which suggested to me the surreal image of a giant literally covering the waterfront. I learned years later that the song was inspired by a novel and film of the same name. In the song, it's a woman waiting by the waterfront, likely in vain for her lover's return, presumably by sea. In the film, it's a journalist whose beat is the waterfront. The first Billie Holiday album I owned was a double LP of her 30s recordings on Columbia called God Bless the Child that came out in 1972. It featured an earlier recording of I Cover the Waterfront where Lady Day sang the song's verse, but she dispensed with it when the later recording for Milt Gabler's independent Commodore label. Gabler would soon become her producer at DECA. 
for me, those 1944 Commodore recordings represent a sweet spot in her career. She was between contracts with John Hammond at Columbia and with Decca, where she was given more of a pop treatment than the pure jazz of her earlier records. Her voice was in fine form, and her interpretation fell somewhere between the youthful verve of many of the Columbia records and the weathered, battle-scarred, simmering intensity of her 50s work. When I think back upon it, I'm really pleased that I found that record in my grandparents' collection, that I was able to to discover Billie Holiday that way. I have no memories of my grandparents' musical taste, and it fills me with joy to imagine them listening to Lady Day together, Grand's ear cocked toward the Victrola, listening intently, and Pop gazing lovingly at Mama, even if, if it never actually happened that way. Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. I, I, I was telling my twin sister today, um, I was giving her the names of your books, and I told her I found one of my new favorite writers. I, I've, I've never heard anyone that could describe music in a way where even if I didn't know exactly um, the artist, I know Billie Holiday's history, but I don't know all of her recordings or any of these labels, but you make us want to learn more. So thank you. That was beautiful. And the nostalgia that you write about with your grandparents, it's just, yeah. Yeah. How did that story come What's about? What's your process? Um, you know, oh, I was just going to say before that, uh, even if people don't know the music, what I've done is provide uh, links to playlists of all the music in the book. So one can actually listen along while one reads the pieces. I didn't even think of doing that. I need to do that tomorrow. I'm going to do that. Seriously. Mm-hmm. So tell well, me. Um, my... Yes, I'm asking how, how this project came about. Like what's your what was your process in writing in number one in this abbreviated form? Because it is a, a chat book, which is a little shorter than your other books. And then how did you get the idea to write all these different chapters with different songs? Where did that come from? Is that something you always wanted to do? Uh, It actually came from another writer who kind of invented the form of musical memoir that I've followed here. And I think I'm really the first person who's taken his idea and run with it. And and this was the Bay Area writer, Al Young, wonderful poet, novelist, nonfiction writer, who just died recently. Um, And he wrote four books of what he called musical memoirs. And it was essentially what I was inspired uh, to take up, which was looking at songs and the way they key into uh, events, memories in, in one's life, because music has such a strong emotional connection to most people. And I think we often sort of key our memories to songs. So I, I thought when Al Young did that, it was just brilliant. And so I have to give credit where it's due. That was where the form came from. And I think I just felt uh, after having finished uh, another collection of fiction uh, that I wanted to try a nonfiction project. Um, It actually, uh, I wrote many more pieces than I ended up with in the book. And I found that some of them didn't have that right balance of the personal and the uh, expository. Because uh, what I think, uh, when I think the pieces really work, uh, it's got that emotional intensity for me, as well as my knowledge of the music uh, and, you know, filling in some of the details. So it's, it's kind of, uh, it, it's a balance. And I had written many pieces and, Essentially, I chose the subset uh, that I thought, you know, really worked for me. Uh, so I had originally intended to do a longer book of these. And uh, when I decided I, I just didn't think a lot of the pieces were strong enough, uh, that's just about the time that Mark and uh, Dennis, uh, who started uh, Bamboo Dark, uh, with this format, uh, provided me with the perfect answer. And I contacted Mark and I said, you know, I have this series of musical memoirs and 
I have narrowed it down to a to a, a small enough group that I think would work, and that's how we ended up doing that as a bamboo darkness. Wow. Well, the minute I saw the cover, I uh, was talking to Mark, and I said, "I need to interview this guy on my podcast because this is my this is." This is like a dream of mine is to do like something like this. My memoir, my young adult memoir, weaves music in, but not to this extent. I have read a, a memoir that was based on Smith's songs, um, but I need to read Al Young. So thank you for telling us about him and giving us that site. Um, I have a couple of comments for you. Lucy Rodriguez Hanley, who's also a writer, said she loves your story. She loves it. She's going to buy your book. And then uh, my sister Jackie said, I'm reading Al Young and your work, Peter, as I love the workings of your mind. And then Mark Givens put up a link to your blog spot, which I think would have your playlist. Is that right? Uh, if it, I, I do have a, a blog spot page, yes, for the playlist. It yep. hosts uh, Spotify and YouTube playlist. It's, oh, it's also in the ticker tape at the bottom now. Oh, terrific. Thank you, April. That's that's my rock star producer, April, who's always in the background. <laughs> she's she's gorgeous and hot, but she just she lets me take the center stage. Um, so... A lot of your books have been published with Pelicanesis, and now this newest book is with the offshoot press, Bamboo Dart, which is Mark Givens, who owns Pelicanesis, and Dennis Calici, who owns Shrimper Records, and they created this imprint. Um, is your relationship with your press and your editor and the people you work with, is that everything for you? Does that give you the, the, the ability to kind of do what you want, and they trust you and you trust them? That's exactly the word. It's a <clears throat> it's a trust relationship, which mm -hmm. is very rare. Uh, you know, this is uh, the fourth book I've done with Mark, and uh, when I did my first telekinesis book, Lift Your Right Arm, in 2013, that was my first book in about 25 years. Now, uh, gr granted, I I took a break from writing, so uh, I was very active from the late 70s into about 92, I was doing performance, started doing music in the 80s, and uh, just came to a kind of point in life where I, I was at that crossroads. And in the early 90s, I went back to school for a PhD in American studies. So wow. that, that took up my time. Uh, plus, uh, the kind of golden age of the East Village that I was part of in the 80s, you know, uh, where I'm so jealous. So <laughs> uh, there were so many opportunities to perform and publish and great magazines. And, you know, this, this was all kind of dying out by the 90s. And, uh, well, what happened to bring me back was I started something completely different. And about 2006, I started a food blog. Uh, oh because I was, uh, I've been a foodie for years. I was, I was talking, I, I was working, uh, freelancing at an ad agency, and I was always talking about food and travel, and my coworkers, a couple of coworkers would say to me, oh, you really have to, you know, write about this or something. And this was the early days of blog, so I haven't even thought of that, you know. And I said, well, you know, I, uh, I, I love this stuff, but, you know, writing about it would make it a job, and uh, anyway, I prefer word of mouth. And uh, <laughs> one of my friends said, but there's your title, word of mouth. And uh, somebody then turned me on to, you know, the blogging platforms. And uh, so from there, that's when I started writing again. And that's when I really started writing more nonfiction and kind of peppering the blog with more personal pieces because my earlier writing had been much more austere, minimal, uh, pure fiction, and very experimental work, which I still continue to do. But uh, I kind of layered on that extra element of the personal and uh, autobiography without words was the first kind of fruit in books of that, where I did something a little different because I mixed in kind of real memoir and fake memoir. Yeah. Auto fiction, uh, kind right? Of, kind, of, yeah. kind of fake out kind of stuff where 
you know, I would be the character and the stories would start out kind of matter of fact, and then they would take these really surreal turns. And I like the idea that a reader can pick up the book and never know from piece to piece which is real and which is not real. With uh, tracks, it's a different case. It's all real. Yeah. And, you know, I have a whole question for you about um, the autobiography without words. And when you write in third person, that seems to be more the auto fiction where you're inhabiting a role and using these adventure fantasy stories. But there's real memoir clearly in there where you also um, always admit if something may or may not be true, like going to buy Susan Day's Tiger Beat, and that may not, that may be a figment of your imagination, you're not sure. But first, um, you talked about a food blog. And what's really interesting about that, I did not have this on my list of questions, but as I was talking to my twin sister this morning, I said in his autobiography without words, there's so much food in it, all this Chinese food. And there's actually, I think, two or three stories about Chinese food specifically and about New York and about the food scene kind of and being at restaurants and getting lost when you're at a Chinese restaurant because you can't find your way back and your poor friends are sitting there waiting right, to that order. Was kind of a, yeah, that, that was kind of a surreal dream kind of piece, the lost in China. I, <laughs> oh my gosh, it was brilliant. So yeah, you're, the food but, um, is all over it. Yeah, and, and most of those food pieces I wrote for the blog. So it was kind of a different source because the fiction work I write, you know, uh, for publication to send out. But uh, these were things I hadn't even been thinking of a book uh, when, when I wrote them. Uh, they, they made sense in the context of the blog. Uh, I'll tell you the, the reason that book, Autobiography Without Words, came about was because I had written a piece that opens the book and it's the title piece. Uh, and I, uh, and I think I may have published it on, uh, Mark's online literary magazine, Mung Being. But, um, uh, an, another writer who has also published several books with Peloponnesus and is a good friend of mine, Peter Wurzman, uh, when he saw the piece called Autobiography Without Words, he said, that's such a great title. That's got to be the title of the book. Now, it was Peter saying that that had to be a title of the book that started the whole ball rolling for me thinking about, gee, what kind of book could that be? And then I started remembering all of the pieces I had in different places, all of the pieces about a fictional version of me where I call myself in the third person, Mr. Churches, kind of ironically. So... That, that really was the whole germ of that idea to do this kind of, you know, really wild, is it real, is it fake kind of autobiography. Yeah, I was trying to figure it out and I want to read it again and kind of parse it out a little bit. And as someone who herself in her own memoir can tend to be a little unreliable, kind of a Sally J. Friedman, Judy Bloom kind of character at times. Um, but I would call my work memoir with just a touch of autofiction, uh, which I try to acknowledge. Um, but I love that idea and that the reader has to figure it out. What's real? Like I wasn't, I thought that one of the stories was real that maybe wasn't. That was a dream sequence. And I, Jean Genet, I, there's an old book that I read in college did that. And um, thank you. I mean, it's anyone that hasn't read this book autobiography without words it is a fascinating study in craft and not only that but um new york city is such a character in your work and in my stories the inland empire the southern california region of the inland empire which is not an empire it's the opposite um is a character <laughs> so i love people that take geography and place and their hometown kind of like James Joyce did in Dubliners. And you have a story in autobiography without words. It's uh, one of my favorite stories in the book called downtown made me. Um, so how do you feel about New York city being a character in your work? Is it part of your identity as a writer and singer? Oh, it's part of my identity as a person, you know, uh, it's it just, it's it such a, specific, distinct uh, vibe, uh, place. Uh, I don't think one can grow up, you know, I'm a native New Yorker. I've lived here all my life. I travel a lot, but I've never lived uh, for a long period elsewhere. And I think when you're a native New Yorker, there's just a whole 
sensibility you carry with you. Yeah, and I hate to, uh, one of my favorite shows is Sex in the City, I have to admit. I don't consider it a guilty pleasure. I love it. I love the writing. I love the characters. Um, and and um, you've been compared to one of the characters in, in Sex in the City, but she has a whole episode about how New York City, um, how she identifies herself with the city. And so I, I just love that. And I think New York City as an icon anyways, it's such a, just its own place much like texas and california that it's just it, it just adds so much to your character um but going back um to your book uh tracks i wanted to ask you about another thing that you have in this book so that everyone reads it and we can talk about it a little bit there's a piece in there titled chris smither no love today from live as i'll ever be um, which is really about how one discovers a new artist in a live setting. And you have this um, statement that you make when you see an artist that you don't have a preconceived notion about, it's a high. And that has happened to me. I saw the Decembrists, who I did not know very well. I only knew a couple of their songs. And we went on a lark to the Greek Theater in LA. And it was one of the best concerts of my life because I wasn't waiting for what song to play. I didn't know their music. And I just listened so uh do you want to talk to the audience about that theory it's really a theory right well i mean i think it's it's the same with all kinds of art with writers too you sort of you know there are writers you're familiar with you're comfortable with you know what you're going to get essentially you compare their books to each other if you read a lot of them uh and you're not going to be really shaken out of your expectations uh an artist you know nothing about really and they come on and they're like you know at the top of their craft it, it as i think it's such a high because you are being hit with this thing as an experience that you have not created a filter for and i think mm -hmm. that's what it's all about that you're getting this thing without any preconceived notions uh, which which can sometimes stand in the way, even with artists you love. Oh, it does. Like for Morrissey, for example, his set lists are notoriously um, either really good or really bad. He'll have some really slow, slow set lists. The Cure used to do really slow set lists. Now they do faster set lists. I tend to um, gravitate towards a faster set list rather than a dreamy set list. But um, tell us about the music that you love. You have such a wide breadth of knowledge and love for music. You love everything that appears from rock to the blues to world music. Like, how did you discover all this music? Is it just in your soul? Well, <clears throat> I, I don't know about that, but I, I think sort of one of, one of the things that the cumulative, the, the sum of the parts of tracks is, is it tells that story across the pieces. Um, I grew up around a lot of music. I had an older brother, 12 years older, who was obsessed with the Rat Pack, the Great American Songbook. So that's how I got that in my blood. You know, you played a little excerpt of my uh, Johnny Mercer album. <clears throat> and, you know, that, you know, that kind of music. So I was getting that before I was eight years old. That was just, you know, in, in the soundscape of, of my home. And... You know, there, everybody was listening to the radio, whether it was my mother listening to the station that played Frank Sinatra, my other older brother listening to the rock stations that were playing. Let's say before the Beatles, it was uh, the Four Seasons, Jay and the Americans, the Beach Boys. So, you know, having two older brothers and a mother who was also, you know, really into that classic American songbook music, that was the baseline. Uh, by the time I was a teenager and listening to a lot of, you know, when Hendrix and all of the blues oriented uh, bands were, were coming out, um, that was when I was one of those kids who wanted to find out the roots of that music. You know, I saw that this guy, Willie Dixon, wrote this song, Spoonful, that all these bands were playing. So I wanted to know what the original sound like. That's how I became a blues fan. Um, and I have a piece uh, exactly about that, about kind of 
getting into the blues by following the, the rock recordings of those blues tunes. Jazz also was kind of in the background in the household, and it just it just really struck a nerve with me. It really uh, spoke to me. Uh, and uh, by the time I was 16, I was like so totally a jazz fan that I had pretty mm-hmm. much... Uh, given up on uh, on rock. I, I really don't know very much rock after 1974, I have to admit. But I <laughs> uh, started going to jazz concerts at age 16. Uh, wow. And, uh, you know, that was how that happened. So later on, you know, jazz leads to, you hear a Brazilian musician like Milton Nascimento singing on a Wayne Shorter record. And, whoa, well, now I've got a you know, follow the path into Brazilian music through Milton and Nelson. Uh, that, that's how I sort of, you know, grazed around in all those different styles. Yeah, and it's very interesting how you talk about those interconnections, and that's kind of how I found bands. You know, I might have started loving Morrissey, and he was b- obsessed with the New York Dolls, so I started listening to them, and then I loved the Sex Pistols and the Buzzcocks. But then I was like, oh, like, what was before this, right? And what was after it? Joy Division, mm-hmm. Bauhaus, stuff like that. But I think that music people are a special breed, kind of like dog people. I'm both. I'm a music person and a dog person. And... um there's a certain affinity, I think, that you that I can just connect with. There's a piece, and I think autobiography without words, and tell me if I'm wrong, where you quote uh, the leader of the packs, I met him in a candy store. And I was like, oh my gosh, my dad used to play that song obsessively. And I was like filled with nostalgia for a moment and wa- listening, watching my dad play on the record player that song, leader of the pack, vroom, vroom, right? Yeah, and that piece was a kind of memoir of the candy store of my childhood where where we hung out. And, uh, you know, it was kind of, you know, I, I say in that piece that for certain neighborhoods in New York in the 60s, it was a kind of social gathering place. The barber shop was an African-American community. Yeah. Those two cent candies, one cent candies. You know, when I used to visit my grandpa in Norco by the cow farms in California, he would give us, um, he, he only spoke Spanish, so he'd tell us in Spanish and like, hold out your hands and he'd pour coins in and we'd walk to the liquor store and pull our change to get, you know, a big honk. But I remember the five cent candies, but, you know, I can't even imagine what that microcosm must have been like in New York City to be at the candy store with egg creams and all this candy and all these different kids from different, you know, houses and neighborhoods and all coming together. It must have been fascinating, especially being able to look back and write about that, you know, having that experience to write about it. Yeah, well, you know, in New York, we called them the candy store and they had a candy counter up front, but really it was a luncheonette, newsstand, you know, all rolled into one. I don't know if uh, on the West Coast people use the word candy, term candy store to describe a place like that, but, you know, these places were ubiquitous in New York in the, you know, up until maybe the 70s, and then they just started disappearing. Kind of like the modern, like a bodega is now, they're everywhere in New York, and uh, I guess yeah, no more candy just, stores. Just, just sit down and have a malted. Yeah. Wow. I want an egg cream now. Um, so... <laughs> For you, how many do you go to a lot of live shows? And if you do, was the pandemic hard for you? It was heartbreaking for me. I literally canceled like 15 show tickets of different bands over the pandemic. I got a lot of money back, but I was sad that I didn't get to see some of my favorite bands live. Well, yes, I do go to a lot of live music, including going to jazz festivals around the world where I, you know, may spend, you know, three days. To, uh, a week just totally immersed in music, you know, concert to concert to concert. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm 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 pretty easygoing about dealing with the pandemic. If uh, you know, I, I sort of, you know, I'm stoic about it. Uh, I know I will get back to it. Uh, kind of having this lifelong history of seeing so much music it's almost as if you kind of store the energy and it's 
doesn't hurt as much, maybe. Yeah, maybe I need to think about it like that. I'm going to see one of my favorite punk bands, X, on August 1st at the um, Orange County with Dennis Kalichi and his wife are meeting us there, and me and my husband there with their kid. And um, I'm just, I don't even know how I'm going to react. I haven't, I, oh, I saw Big Bad Voodoo Daddy last weekend, but they're not really my favorite band versus X, which is one of my top five. So I don't know if I'm just going to go cuckoo and like jump up and down like a like a jack in the box and, uh, you know, pogo dance the whole time and scream myself hoarse, but that's okay. You know, <laughs> I'm going to try not to drink so I can really enjoy it though. That's my goal. But Jackie, I don't always do that. Jackie had a question. Oh, go ahead, April. You want to read it? Peter, what's your favorite food while writing or before or after writing? Uh, I, I don't think I have any connection to what I eat and what I write, actually. <laughs> oh, oh my one, sister. One thing I actually wanted to say before, uh, when we were talking about food and music and stuff, as music people, food people, is that these, these are kind of, you know, primal passions. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can understand people who aren't really into music. And I can understand people who aren't really into food, but I can't understand people who have no interest in food or music. <laughs> exactly. Perfect. Uh, exactly right. You got to have one of those two passions or you are sorely lacking in some love there because those are my <laughs> two favorite things. Oh, well, beer too, but does that count? I don't know. <laughs> it's a food group for me. Food. <laughs> Jinx. Exactly. Exactly. It has yeast. So it's, it's food. Um, so before, um, I'm going to ask you a couple more questions, but we're at 741. So we have about five more minutes. Um, where can people find your work? Like, uh, where would you suggest they go if they want to find, they can go to the bamboo dart press website, obviously, and they can go to Pelicanesis, but, um, should they just search you on Google, go to your website and all that? I don't really have a formal writer's website. I have a writer's page on Facebook that I post uh, notices when I'm published in you know journals online, whatever. I would say uh, just a Google search of my name to find recent uh, online publications. But uh, the books are always there. The books are always there. Tracks, Memoirs from a Life with Music. That's his most recent book published by Bamboo Dart autobiography without words it's an enigma you're gonna have to read it twice published by pelicanesis one of my favorite books i've ever read um peter church's look at this cover lift your right arm pelicanesis again and whistler's mother's son what a cover also by pelicanesis so pick those up people we're here to introduce you to new writers um that you that you may not i mean He's very established, but you may not have heard of him. And uh, I certainly um, had heard of him, but I never read his work at length. And it, it is amazing, Peter. So thank you for being on. I I really am honored to have you. I feel unworthy to interview someone of your caliber, but I appreciate you coming on to my humble show. Well, this was a great pleasure and it was a great interview. So do not feel unworthy. Oh, good. Good. Okay. So um, I have one last question. Um, you're a singer as well and a lyricist and a performance artist. Um, is that exhausting or is it exhilarating to kind of do all these different things, to have your hands in a lot of different pots? It was exhausting and exhilarating when I was doing a lot of all of those things at the same time back in the 80s. Um, I, I sort of am a little more balanced about uh, dipping in and out of those different parts uh, for different periods now. Uh, so it's more manageable. Um, yeah. But, uh, and I, you know, I mentioned before about this break I took from kind of all of my artistic pursuits. And um, I got back into singing a little later than I got back into writing, more like about 2013. Uh, there's a piece of tracks that actually explains uh, this crystallizing moment in in Greece at the at an ancient Greek theater uh, that inspired me to uh, take singing seriously again, and so that's how I ended up doing this project of doing this album of Johnny Mercer songs. 
Uh, I had gone back to do some kind of refresher voice workshops and, uh, I, I write lyrics, uh, both to original songs and additional lyrics for jazz songs. Um, so the, the piece you had played an excerpt from I'm Old Fashioned from this uh, collection of Johnny Mercer songs I had done. I wrote an additional second chorus of lyrics kind of as a tribute to Johnny Mercer's original where I kind of riffed off of uh, the, the lyric he had written and also kind of created a new melody to make it a solo. I, I, I based it on the vocalese technique in jazz where you take a recorded solo by a famous uh, saxophonist or trumpeter and add lyrics to it. But I, I, I had done some of that, but in some cases, I would kind of create my own solos. I'd, uh, I'd make my own melody over the chord changes and write the lyrics at the same time. So that's essentially the second half of that recording of I'm Old Fashioned is my own lyrics uh, that kind of continue the story. Wow. Okay. Well, we're going to, we're going to play that whole song right now, but just let me say that um, this is the last episode of season one of life of gem. There's 18 episodes. Go to my life of gem Facebook page or to my website, 180 com to download or watch um, the archived versions of all of these interviews. And this one should be up on the website within the next week. If you want to rewatch it and, buy these books especially tracks listen to it with the um with the playlist that peter created and i'm going to do that tomorrow i think i'm going to take the day off and do that because i need a break from work because this is what i love this music memoir thank you peter for coming on again i'm honored thanks for having me this was really a great pleasure <laughs> okay and let's play that whole track we're going to listen to that whole song i'm old-fashioned based on a Johnny Mercer tune that um, Peter added lyrics to as well. So I want to hear the whole thing. Let's take it out. All right. Here you go. Thank you, April. Thank you for everything. But sighing sighs and holding hands, these my heart understands. I'm old-fashioned, but I don't mind it. That's how I want to be. Just as long as you'll agree To stay old-fashioned with me Positively carbon dated Though time stood still through all these years I have stood around and waited for someone just like you To make my dreams come true And pass the future just with me It's a verity that timeless virtues will never ever hurt you let's take a page from history and weave a tale of you and me and now i know the present is gonna be oh so pleasant if you will take a vow to realize that now's the time to be old-fashioned regressive Stay old fashioned with me. 
Bravo. Bye, everyone. Thanks for watching.